A reading from the prophet Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings, with two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me! I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. 
For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Jesus Christ. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The Gospel of the Lord. Please take your seats. Today is Trinity Sunday, the only day in the church year that is dedicated to a doctrine. 
And the Trinity certainly is a doctrine, but that's not all the Trinity is. The Trinity is also, much more importantly, a mystery. It's something that is relatively easy to describe, but nearly impossible to understand. Last week on the day of Pentecost, we celebrated the arrival of the Holy Spirit in a rush of wind, with tongues of fire dancing on the apostles' heads. The Holy Spirit, God at work in the world here and now, the Lord who leads us into all truth, and enables us to grow into the likeness of Christ. And with the arrival of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity finally takes shape. And we describe it in many different ways. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the oldest one, although Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier of all is rising in the poles because it avoids using gendered language for God, whom we call Father but isn't actually male. It's a metaphor that sheds light on God while also obscuring part of God at the same time. The Trinity was experienced by the disciples there on the day of Pentecost, and disciples have been trying to explain just what the Trinity is ever since. This is much easier said than done. In many parishes, today isn't Trinity Sunday so much as it is Guest Preacher Sunday, because the rector wants to have anyone else try and describe the mystery of the Trinity instead of them. Although I think Father Jed could have, he didn't have to go quite such theatrical lengths as getting COVID in order to get out of preaching, but to each their own. So it falls to me to shed some light on the mystery of the Trinity with us today. The best, earliest attempt to explain and define the Trinity comes in the form of the Athanasian Creed, named for a famous defender of Nicene theology, Athanasius of Alexandria. Of course, it's named for him, even though there is almost zero chance it was written by him. But let's not let the truth get in the way of a good story, right? The creed dates back to the sixth century and is notable for both addressing the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of Christology. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and God is the Father, and God is the Son, and God is the Holy Spirit, but the Father is not the Son, and the Father is not the Holy Spirit, and so on and so forth. It's riveting. <laughs> There's a reason we don't say this one in the liturgy, y'all. We refer to each of the parts of the Trinity as persons. The Trinity is three persons in one being. And each of the persons of the, of the Trinity is defined in the creed as uncreated, unlimit, limitless, eternal, and omnipotent. The Athanasian Creed is in the prayer books in front of you, in the historical documents section on page 864, if you feel like looking it up later. Be warned, it's not to be uh, read while operating heavy machinery, because it is, it is a struggle. My hat is off to you. It'll be a star in your crown for those of you who read it today. The, this creed may be among the earliest attempts to define and illuminate the mystery of the Holy Trinity, but it was certainly not the last. There are images of this mystery throughout Christian history. Tradition holds that Patrick of Ireland used the shamrock to teach of the Trinity. Three leaves, one plant. The Russian Iconographer Andrei Rublev created probably the best known icon of the Holy Trinity, depicting three angels seated at a table, sharing a meal, evoking both the angels that visited Abraham in the 18th chapter of Genesis, but also the Holy Trinity of the New Testament, 
That one image is a wealth of symbolism which explains, at least in part, why this particular icon is considered by many one of the highest achievements ever in Russian art. One of my personal favorite illustrations of the Holy Trinity comes from St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, one of the great spiritual directors of the church. Ignatius came to understand the Trinity as three keys, that is, musical keys on an organ, what we would today call a chord, and a chord made up of three notes related to each other in a specific way is known as a triad, which sounds like Trinity. I wonder, could we, could we get a quick triad on the organ? Could you step over there and... If I was the rector, I'd have cleared this beforehand. <laughs> Instead, I'm a guest, and so I can just say, go play the organ. <laughs> Listen to that. Three notes, one chord. So we're done, right? Should I just go sit down? Thank you. Thank you for service in the face of adversity. I appreciate it. One of the oldest ways, I will not ask for any further music from you during the sermon, I promise. <laughs> One of the oldest ways of understanding the Holy Trinity is by means of a Greek term, perichoresis. The term was first used by Gregory of Nazianzus, being a compound word derived from the words peri, meaning around, and chorea, which refers to dance, specifically around dance with its music. The three persons of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, existing as a single unity bound together and to each other in a dancing circle. At my seminary, church history was taught by a professor now of blessed memory who had been there, it seemed, since the seminary was founded, 180 years earlier, and his lecture on perichoresis was legendary for his attempt in the lecture to demonstrate the dance of the Trinity for the edification of his students by himself, somehow portraying all three persons of the Trinity. Suffice it to say that his gifts in teaching outshone his gifts in dance. It was a comic highlight of the entire three years of seminary. And he was absolutely in on the joke, I should say. I, I share this story with fondness, not out of snark. He, uh, he is, I hope, looking down and smiling now as I say this. You can also ask Father Jed. He uh, suffered that same lecture the year before I did, and uh, he will wince and tell you about Father Wright's perichoresis dance. One of the things that is particularly beautiful about this image of the Trinity is the fact that dance only exists in the dancing. Dance, like music or acting, is inherently ephemeral. Once the performance is over, there is no artifact left over apart from the memories that we hold of the performance in the minds of those who heard it. Even if a dance is recorded on video, it's still not the same thing to experience it on a screen as it is to experience it there in the presence of a dancer or as a dancer yourself. And that's the beautiful thing about this particular dance. Among these three particular persons, it goes on for all eternity. The three of them connected and in motion, continuing their dance which gives life and to both the church and the world. It's easy to see how this would be a mystery. How does that dance continue without stopping? What does that dance look like? How can a dance bring life to the world in the way that it does? None of these questions have answers. That's why it's a mystery, and one that we will never understand fully while we're on this side of the veil. The Trinity is a mystery one that makes it futile to even tr begin trying to explain it in any final or complete way. If you think you have the Trinity figured out, you are most likely wrong. 
And it's a mystery that is always going to be elusive and difficult to pin down. In that way, the only way to really say anything of any import about the Trinity is to talk about one's experience of the Trinity. And there, we can actually say something. After all, the Trinity is the unity of God, Christ, and Spirit. Together, they make up everything bound into one. The sun shining after an atmospheric river dumps water on you for a week gives us a glimpse of God's transcendence. And that is an experience of the Trinity. That moment when you find the right words to say to someone who really needed to hear them in that moment, and then you ask yourself, where did that come from? That's an experience of the Holy Trinity. As a parent of a young child, I can assure you that personally, the moment that your infant daughter really laughs for the first time, and you get the slightest glimpse of a personality creeping forth out of what is otherwise an adorable blob of needs and mysterious potential and it makes the world stop turning for a minute you know that sort of experience that is an experience of the trinity the trinity is what we believe it's the container that this whole story fits into in order to make sense and it's a ministry a mystery so we're never going to really get our arms around it but that shouldn't stop us from trying I mean, all of the examples of the Trinity that we've explored from the Athanasian Creed and Rubliev's icon, Ignatius of Loyola's chord and the dance of perichoresis, each have gotten us that much closer to glimpsing what the Trinity really is, each in their own way. And we're that much closer to understanding it by partaking together in the bread and wine of the Eucharist today. It's a mystery that we can't ever understand fully but it's one that we experience every day if we're paying attention. And we will continue to do so for as long as the dance continues. Amen. By to stand that we may affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. 
for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who suit the truth. For Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Michael, our presiding bishop. Melissa, our bishop provisional. Phil, our bishop-elect, and for all bishops and other ministers, for all who serve God in the church, for the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. <coughs> we will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them who put their trust in you. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful God. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your spirit that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. My sisters and brothers, the peace of Christ be always with you. Okay, if you can all be seated just for a moment. Um, yeah. So, as you can see, Father Judd is not here. As is mentioned, he is home with COVID. And so we thank Father R.C. Laird for being with us. Um, because Father Judd is not here, um, and I don't know, I'm hoping that he'll be back by Wednesday, um, but I don't know. So before you show up for Eucharist or Bible study or anything on Wednesday, maybe call the office and see whether he's back. <coughs> also, next week is the last class for, of Christian education, both for youth and for adults, um, for, for until then, then we'll be off for the summer. So that is happening next week. And also next week, next weekend is the second, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> next, also next week, we are going to be celebrating um, Father Judd's 15-year anniversary of ordination. And so there will be special coffee hour, and after we're going to try after both the services. So stay after the services. Well, you could stay after today too, but there's no celebration. <laughs> but but um, yeah, next week let's make sure and and 
wish Jed the best. <laughs> um, yes, his birthday and anniversary, <laughs> wedding anniversary. So really, really wish Father Jed the best next week. <laughs> now, walk in love as Christ loved us giving himself as an offering and sacrifice to God.
May God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the one who created us. God of all power, sustainer of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be, the vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile Earth, our island home. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the stewards of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time, you sent your only son, born of Mary, his mother, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. Therefore, we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those <clears throat> in every generation who have looked to you in hope to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. And so, most gracious God, we who have been redeemed by Christ and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his friends and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, <clears throat> gave thanks, and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. God of our kindred and their generation, God of Abraham, Isaac, of Jacob, Deborah, Hannah, and Rebecca, God and Father of our Savior, Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in your Son's name. Risen and ascended one, be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praises, O God, most merciful through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. <coughs> we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. Now and forever Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. <coughs> the gifts of God for the people of God. Holy things for holy people.
Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Savior. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. The Lord God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the holy and undivided Trinity, guard you, save you, and bring you to that heavenly city where he lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen.
Let us go forth to love and serve the Lord.